Lecture 16, The Constructivist View of Perception. In the previous lecture, I introduced some problems for the ecological point of view on perception. First, the conceptual problem. Even if we could show that the information available in the stimulus environment is sufficient for perception, it's another thing entirely to show that the perceiver actually makes use of this information. But then, there are some empirical problems as well. First, the problem of perceptual organization, as discussed by the Gestalt psychologists, and the problem of pattern recognition, as encountered in word and speech perception. And finally, the problem of the perceptual constancies, where perception remains constant despite changes in the pattern of stimulation. These empirical problems are more or less problematic for the ecological view. Perceptual constancies? Probably less problematic. Pattern recognition in speech and word perception? Certainly more problematic. Now let's look at four other sets of empirical findings that seem to cause problems for the ecological view of perception and seem to warrant another view entirely. This alternative point of view is known as the constructivist view of perception, which is probably best expressed by the American psychologist Jerome Bruner with his idea that the perceiver must go beyond the information given by the stimulus. Bruner and other constructivists have argued that under ordinary conditions, the stimulus information is simply insufficient for perception. And sometimes, stimulus information is downright misleading. Instead of a relatively mechanistic view, the constructivist view of perception is as intelligent problem-solving activity. The perceiver is trying to make sense of the stimulus environment. This problem-solving activity requires that the perceiver bring to bear on the act of perception his or her knowledge of the world, and apply processes of judgment, inference, and reasoning to make sense of the stimulus environment, and figure out what objects there are in the world, where they are, and what they're doing. The constructivist tradition is probably the oldest tradition in the study of perception. And, in fact, Gibson's ecological view was presented as a radical alternative to this traditional constructivist view. Usually, in this course, we're going to overturn traditional views of things. But in this case, as you'll see, the constructivist tradition seems to have the right idea about, per about perception. In any event, as far as scientific psychology is concerned, the constructivist tradition begins with Hermann von Helmholtz, a 19th century physiological psychologist who argued that perception requires the perceiver to make unconscious inferences about the object and its properties. More recently, the constructivist tradition in perception is represented by Richard Gregory, a British psychologist who wrote an important book on perception entitled The Intelligent Eye, and Julian Hochberg, an American psychologist who reformulated the Gestalt law of pregnance as the minimum principle. Hochberg argued that there are a number of different patterns of stimulation that were compatible with any particular percept, and that the job of the perceiver is to choose, to select, that percept which is most compatible with the conditions of stimulation. And finally, Irvin Rock, another American psychologist, mounted perhaps the most direct challenge to the Gibsonian ecological insurgency by writing a book entitled Indirect Perception. Rock argued forcibly that perception was mediated by so-called higher cognitive processes. Consider the following figure, known as Rubin's Vase, in which the observer sees a white goblet or vase against a black background. But keep looking at it for a while, and you'll also see a pair of profiles in silhouette against a white background. Both the vase and the profile are perfectly compatible with the stimulus input. There's nothing in the stimulus that would help us to decide whether this is a white vase against a black background, or two profiles in silhouette against a white background. Here's a real-life version of Rubin's vase. It's a porcelain vase 
it was commissioned to celebrate the Silver Jubilee, or the 25th anniversary, of the accession of Queen Elizabeth II to the British throne. There is the vase with the royal seal in gold, and you can see on the right the profile of Queen Elizabeth, and on the left the profile of Prince Philip, the Prince Consort. Here is a three-dimensional representation of a cube, originally published by Louis Necker, a Swiss crystallographer, who actually noticed this when he was looking at some crystals through a microscope. When you look at this figure, one face of the figure, either A or B, initially appears closer to you, the observer, surface A pointing down to the left, or surface B pointing up to the right. Whichever it is, if you keep looking at the Necker cube, you'll see that the figure flips, so that the other face, B or A, now appears closer. And the longer you look at it, the more it will flip back and forth, first A appearing nearer, then B appearing nearer. The stimulus remains constant, but the percept changes, and changes constantly. Here's a variant on the Necker cube known as Schroeder's staircase. When you first look at this, you probably see the surface labeled A as nearer to you, and the surface labeled B as farther away. But if you look at it long enough, you'll see that the staircase flips upside down, so that wall B now appears closer. Although the Necker cube and the Schroeder staircase were only brought to the attention of psychologists in the 19th century, the figure and the effect it creates is actually very old. In fact, you can see the effect in a mosaic panel found in a house in Antioch, Greece, dating from the second century. Here you can see the effect in the wall painting by a Native American artist at the Mission San Javier del Bac in Tucson, Arizona, dating from the late 18th century. And here it is again on the floor of a side aisle of the Basilica San Giovanni Laterno, St. John Lateran, the Pope's Church, in Rome, Italy. Here's another one, known as the Boring Figure, originally drawn by a cartoonist for the British humor magazine Puck, and brought to the attention of psychologists by E.G. Boring, a student of Titchener's, who taught for many years at Harvard. When you first look at it, you probably see a woman looking demurely away from you. She's wearing a black stole. She has a necklace tight around her neck. There's a white scarf flowing from her head and a little feather on her cap. Or you can see an older woman scowling, looking down to the left, a scarf over her head, a very long, somewhat misshapen nose. The Puck cartoonist called this, My Wife and My Mother-in-Law. But now it's often known as the Boring Figure. Yes, there's another version of this entitled Husband and Father-in-Law, and there's even a three-person version of it, which can be perceived as a young girl, an old woman, or a man. Here is the Jastro Figure which you can see as a rabbit looking off to the right, or you can see it as a duck looking off to the left. The Jastrow figure was introduced around the turn of the 20th century by Joseph Jastrow, who was the same Joseph Jastrow who was involved in that early subliminal perception experiment. He got it from a cartoon in the American magazine Harper's Weekly, which in turn got it from a German humor magazine. There are lots of these figures around, and they're typically known as ambiguous figures, because what they represent is ambiguous. They're sometimes known as reversible figures, or bi-stable figures, because the stimulus can support two different percepts. The vase or the profiles, the wife or the mother-in-law, the duck or the rabbit. You get one percept, and then after a while it reverses into the other percept and perception never really stabilizes on one or the other. You keep flipping back and forth from one to the other. And the ambiguous figures are important because, in a sense, they illustrate the opposite of the point we made with the perceptual constancies. In the perceptual constancies, perception remains constant despite changes in the pattern of stimulation, though, of course, Gibson would dispute that. But in the ambiguous figures, we have something quite definitive in the reverse. 
in the ambiguous figures, the pattern of proximal stimulation is constant. The image cast by the object on the retina never changes, but it's the perception of the distal stimulus that does change. In the ambiguous figures, stimulation is constant, but perception changes. And that should tell us that there's more to perception than simply unpacking the information in the light. Reversible figures are frequently employed as artistic devices, perhaps most famously by the Dutch painter M. C. Escher in a series of paintings that I think are still the staple of college dormitories all over the world. In Earth and Sky, to the left, the observer can see either white doves against a black background or black crows against a white background. In Circle Limit 4, on the right, the observer can see either white angels against a black background or black devil-like bats against a white background. Perhaps not surprisingly, the surrealist artists were also very fond of ambiguous images. Here's a painting by Salvador Dali, depicting an individual, naked to the waist, sitting at a table outside a kind of ruined building with archways. You can see a candlestick and a broad goblet on the table, and some mountains off in the distance on the right, with some people approaching from the center. And then you look a little bit more, maybe you look a little bit closer, and you see right there, dead center in black and white, the bust of the French philosopher Voltaire. This is Dali's famous painting, Slave Market with Disappearing Bust of Voltaire. Here's a close-up of the bust of Voltaire and a copy of the sculpture, the 18th century sculpture by Houdon, from which it was derived. According to the ecological view of perception, our perceptual systems evolved in such a way that we can directly perceive the world as it really is by extracting information from the stimulus environment. But in the perceptual illusions, we perceive things that aren't there, and we perceive things the way they really aren't. For example, in the miller liar illusion, the line with the feathers looks longer than the line with the arrowheads, even though the two horizontal lines are precisely the same length. You can see clearly that this is the case from this version of the miller liar figure. The miller liar illusion works regardless of whether the lines are horizontal or vertical. The concave corner on the right looks longer than the convex corner on the left. Here again, you can see for yourself that this is the case. Here's another classic illusion, the Ponzo illusion, in which there are converging lines. This is sometimes known as the railroad tracks illusion. The upper horizontal line looks longer than the lower horizontal line, even though the two lines are of exactly identical length. And again, you can determine for yourself that that's the case. Here's another classic illusion, the Ebbinghaus illusion, popularized by Titchener and sometimes known as the Titchener circles. The center circle on the left looks smaller than the center circle on the right, even though, of course, they're exactly the same diameter. Over the years, literally hundreds of illusions have been devised by graphic artists and by psychologists. Here are two more classic illusions based on parallel lines. In the hearing illusion, on the left, the red lines are actually parallel, but they appear to bend outwards. In the Wundt illusion, on the right, the red lines are again parallel, but they appear to bend inwards. Here's another classic illusion, the Pogendorf illusion, in which the diagonal lines appear to be displaced even though they're actually correctly aligned. In this slide, you can check that the two diagonal lines actually come together. Pagendorf was a physicist who introduced this illusion after the effect was brought to his attention by a colleague named Zollner, who noticed it in a fabric pattern in his house. You can see a variant on the Pagendorf illusion in the Union Jack, 
the British flag, which unites the cross of St. George for Britain, the cross of St. Andrew for Scotland, and the cross of St. Patrick for Ireland. Note that the diagonal red lines which come into the center of the cross do not actually meet. Now this flag was adopted in 1801, which is more than 50 years before Pagendorf and Zollner had their conversation. So the flag makers had no idea about the Pagendorf illusion. But when you look at the British flag, you just don't see it that way. You see the red lines intersecting the way they ought to visually, even though they actually don't in the physical stimulus. And that's kind of the reverse of the Pagendorf illusion. Here's another classic illusion, the horizontal vertical illusion introduced by Fick and popularized by Wundt in the middle part of the 19th century. These two lines are exactly equal in length, but most observers perceive the vertical line to be about 10% longer than the horizontal line. The horizontal vertical illusion was put to good use by the architect Eero Sorinen in his gateway arch on the Mississippi River at St. Louis. The height of the arch is exactly the same as the length of its base, but the arch just looks much taller than that, and it's very striking when you see it in real life. Again, there are lots of different illusions, and different illusions have different explanations in terms of the principles by which the perceptual system operates. But the miller lyer illusion and the Ponzo illusion belong to a class of illusions that appear to be explained by the distance cues that we talked about in an earlier lecture. Note that in the miller lyer illusion, the feathers in the upper part look like converging lines. And of course, the lines do converge in the Ponzo illusion in the bottom figure. By virtue of depth cues like linear perspective created by these convergence lines, the upper line in both the miller lyer illusion and the Ponzo illusion looks farther away than the lower line. But the length of the retinal image cast by these lines is the same, because they are, after all, the same length. Therefore, applying the size-distance rule, the perceiver concludes, or infers, that the upper line must really be farther away than the lower line. And because it's farther away, but still casts a relatively large retinal image, it must be actually longer than the lower line. So here, the miller lyer illusion and the Ponzo illusion appear to result from the application of the size-distance rule we discussed in the earlier lecture. Now, of course, nobody goes through this kind of reasoning consciously, but that's what Helmholtz meant when he referred to unconscious inferences. Another illusion created by distance cues is the moon illusion, in which the moon looks larger when it's just rising over the horizon than when viewed overhead at its zenith. The illusion was first noticed, at least as far back as Aristotle, who attributed it to magnification effects created by the atmosphere. We now know, through formal experiments, that distance cues more likely play a role. You remember the distance cue of elevation, in which objects near the horizon appear farther away than objects that are far from the horizon. Therefore, the moon on the horizon looks farther away, compared to the moon at zenith. But of course, the retinal size of the image of the two moons remains constant. Therefore, the perceptual system concludes that the moon at the horizon must be larger, an effect that's abetted by the fact that there are lots of other distance cues available when you view the moon on the horizon than there are when you view the moon all alone there in space overhead. This is another unconscious inference, but it's an inference nonetheless that goes beyond the information given by the stimulus to draw a conclusion about where the stimulus must be and how big it must be. The way many illusions work the general principles of the illusions are revealed dramatically in a construction known as the Ames Room, devised by Adelbert Ames, a vision scientist in the early 1930s, based on suggestions by Hermann von Helmholtz. The Ames Room is a sealed space into which the observer looks with one eye through a small peephole. 
and what you see is something like this, with two people who appear to differ radically in height. In this illustration, in fact, the two girls are identical twins, as close in height as any two people could possibly be. But they don't look that way. The one looks much taller than the other, an illusion that's created by certain features of the room, features that are deliberately designed to take advantage of rules like the size-distance relationship and other aspects of perception to fool the eye into seeing something quite different from what's actually there. Here's how the Ames room actually looks. First, remember that the observer is looking through a peephole using one eye, which effectively deprives the observer of certain binocular cues to distance. Second, the observer is actually looking from the side of the room, not the center, so he or she is not equidistant from the two side walls. When you approach the Ames room from the outside, you think the peephole is located in the center of the wall, but it's really not. The rear wall, the wall farthest from the viewer, is angled sharply away from the observer, so that the observer's eyes are not equidistant from the two corners, where the girls are. And the ceiling is also angled sharply away from the observer, so the ratio of the girls' bodies to the back wall is not invariant. The ceiling on the right side is much closer to the floor than the ceiling on the left side, and the windows are also changed in shape. They're trapezoidal, rather than rectangular, to reinforce the appearance of a standard room. In this way, the room provides the observer with none of the regular distance cues. Still, the observer, based on prior experience with rooms, assumes that there are equal distances and right angles and things are rectangular and things are equal in height and equal in distance. For this reason, the observer, lacking the usual sorts of distance cues, will infer the size of the distal stimuli directly from the size of the retinal images. But because the observer's assumptions are all wrong, he or she makes incorrect inferences about size. The Ames room works because perception is determined not just by the physical stimulus, but also by the perceiver's knowledge, beliefs, and expectations. The perceiver's expectations about what a proper room looks like and how it's constructed. Again, it's precisely because the perceiver goes beyond the information given in the stimulus that the Ames room works as an illusion at all. I've left out some details here, but you get the basic idea. In fact, the precise mechanisms of many visual illusions are a little bit more complicated than presented here, and some details remain controversial or obscure. What the illusions make clear, however, is that perception is not just the product of information provided by the proximal stimulus and extracted by innate, mindless perceptual mechanisms. The perceiver brings something to the act of perception, brings knowledge, beliefs about the world, and expectations about what he or she is going to see. And the perceiver's internal perceptual representation of the world is going to be shaped by higher mental processes involving this knowledge, memory, expectations, judgment, and inference. The perceiver goes beyond the information given. The contributions of the perceiver to the act of perception are also revealed by cultural influences on perception, the fact that people from different cultures may see very different things in the very same stimulus. For example, this geological structure in northwestern New Mexico, a volcanic vent millions of years old that sits on the Navajo Indian Reservation, is commonly known as shiprock, and you can see how it gets its name. It looks a little bit like a clipper ship with sails. And that's the name the European settlers gave it in the 1870s. And that's the name of the nearest town, the largest town on the Navajo Reservation. But of course, the Navajo themselves had lived in this area long before the settlers came, and they didn't know anything about clipper ships. In fact, their name for the mountain translates as rock with wings, or winged rock. <laughs>
They knew about wings from birds, eagles, things like that, but they didn't know anything about clipper ships. The same geological formation got two different names because it was perceived differently by people of two different cultures. Here is another figure, which most people see as some sort of whale. There's its head at the lower right, a flipper somewhere in the center, and the tail in the upper left. But if you keep looking at it for a while, maybe some other figures come to mind. For example, you can also see this figure as a kangaroo, with the kangaroo's tail in the lower right, its legs in the middle, and its snout and ears in the upper left. This is a figure devised in my laboratory when I was at the University of Arizona, and we call it the Arizona Whale Kangaroo. In an experiment that I conducted with some Arizonan and Australian colleagues, we presented this figure to North American and Australian college students and asked them what they saw. We also presented the figure in various orientations. Here is what we think of as the canonical orientation for the whale kangaroo, with the whale in a very familiar swimming position and the kangaroo in a very familiar sitting position, but also in a non-canonical position. For example, this one's flipped 180 degrees, so that the whale appears to be swimming upside down and the kangaroo appears to be lying on its back with its feet up in the air. People are used to seeing whales and kangaroos in the canonical position, but they're not so used to seeing whales and kangaroos in the non-canonical position. That's why we call it canonical. Here are the basic results of the experiment showing the percentage of subjects in each of the two groups, Americans and Australians, who saw the whale or the kangaroo at the canonical and non-canonical orientations. Everybody saw the whale, and everybody saw the whale at both canonical and non-canonical orientations. Subjects were more likely to see the kangaroo when it was presented in its canonical orientation compared to its non-canonical orientation. But the important point here is that Australians were much more likely to see the kangaroo to begin with at any orientation compared to the Americans. The results aren't so surprising, I suppose, the kangaroo is kind of the unofficial national animal of Australia, and Australians are used to seeing kangaroos everywhere, in real life and on television and in magazines and in lots of different positions. But that's the point. Australians are more familiar with kangaroos. They are much more likely to see that ambiguous figure as a kangaroo as well as a whale. What the perceiver brings to perception helps determine what the perception is. The constellations seen in the night sky offer another example of cultural influences on perception. The constellations were originally developed by ancient cultures to aid navigation, and sometimes astrology as well, and they are usually considered to reflect organization by gestalt principles such as good continuation and closure. Here we see two prominent constellations that can be seen in the sky over the northern hemisphere, Orion the hunter and Taurus the bull. You can see that Orion looks kind of like a hunter. You can see the arm with the shield, the upraised arm with the club, the belt, and the kneecaps or ankles. And Taurus looks at least a little bit like a bull, especially with respect to the horns. And you can see pretty easily how such images could be conjured up by observers using gestalt principles of grouping by proximity, good continuation, good form, and the like. But, to be honest, other constellations don't necessarily look anything like their reference. Take, for example, the constellation of Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. This constellation is recognized by almost all cultures in the Northern Hemisphere, ancient or modern, but, you know, it doesn't really look very much like a bear. And, in fact, although the great bear is pretty commonly seen from one culture to another, there are other possible percepts. And, in fact, different cultures see this very same pattern of stars in rather different ways. Many European cultures, for example, see this pattern as the Big Dipper. <laughs> 
And I guess, truth to tell, it really does look more like a dipper than a bear. But in England, the same pattern of stars is sometimes called the plow. In China, it was called the celestial bureaucrat. In medieval Europe, the Charles wagon, a wagon that was used for transporting the dead bodies of victims of the plague. And in ancient Egypt, the same pattern of stars was seen as a complex depiction of a monster combining a bull, a man, a hippopotamus, and a crocodile, all out of less than a dozen stars. In each case, the astronomer was bringing cultural knowledge to bear in making sense of the same stimulus pattern. And astronomers in different cultures saw different things in the skies, depending on the experiences and preconceptions that they brought to the act of perception. Sometimes, as Helmholtz noted, perceptual inference is unconscious, and these unconscious influences give rise to the perceptual constancies and perceptual illusions that we've been discussing so far. Other times, however, it's quite clear that perceptual problem-solving requires active, conscious effort on the part of the perceiver. This fact is illustrated by so-called gestalt figures, which are degraded line drawings or photographs of objects that are difficult to perceive and identify. Here's a famous example, one that you may well have seen before. Take a look at it for a couple of seconds and see if you can make it out. It's a Dalmatian dog walking from the lower right to the upper left and sniffing the ground. Here is one that may be a little less familiar to you. Take a look at it and try to figure out what it is. It's an old-fashioned steam locomotive. You can see the cow catcher in the lower left, one of the wheels in the lower right, the big tank in the center, and a spotlight in the upper left with some steam coming out. Here's another one, perhaps a little more difficult. It's a table, maybe a dining room table. You can see three of the legs and the surface of the table, and also some bowls, maybe fruit or some other objects on it. This one's definitely more difficult. It's kind of hard to figure out, isn't it? Turn to the next slide. See if that makes it easier. I showed you the last slide upside down. This is the same slide right side up. Take another look. Yes, it's a horse and a rider, the horse prancing off to the right. You can see its legs, its tail on the left, its head on the right, the rider with a cape on flowing off to the left. These figures were part of a psychometric test developed in the 1930s to look at individual differences in the application of various gestalt principles. They were never particularly good for that purpose, for reasons that we don't have to get into, but they do kind of model the problem that is set for perceivers all the time, everywhere, figuring out what the stimulus is, where it is, and what it's doing. Perception is a process of problem-solving, of figuring out what's going on in the world outside, and the Gestalt completion test figures capture that process in microcosm very nicely. This is not just the stuff of laboratory experimentation. Expectations and beliefs can have real effects on perception in the real world. A famous example of expectancy-determined perception are the canals on the planet Mars, a discovery first announced by the Italian astronomer Schiaparelli in 1887. Interestingly, Schiaparelli's first drawings of Mars didn't really look like this. An early map from 1877 looks very much like a map of Mars produced by another astronomer at about the same time, but in a somewhat later map, 
dated about 1883, the Martian canals are fully in evidence. The features are much more regular, more geometrical, fueling the speculation that Schiaparelli's canali were artificial structures. When Schiaparelli first described the canali, he meant just channels. But as Schiaparelli's drawings became more regular, more geometrical, Schiaparelli came to the full-blown belief that the canali were actually artificially created by intelligent beings to move water from the Martian poles to desert areas. As Schiaparelli publicized his findings, other astronomers began to see the same thing. For example, Percival Lowell, an American astronomer observing Mars from his private observatory at Flagstaff, Arizona in 1894. Now Lowell was no fool. He was an amateur astronomer who built his observatory on the basis of family money, but he was a very smart amateur astronomer and a very good amateur astronomer. He had predicted the existence of planet X based on eccentricities observed in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. And, in fact, in 1930, more than a dozen years after Lowell died, Clyde Tombaugh, one of his associates, actually discovered the planet Pluto. Another researcher at Lowell Observatory was the first to observe the so-called redshift in galaxies that gave rise to the theory of the expanding universe. And for good measure, it was another associate of Lowell's who discovered the relationship between climate and tree growth and invented the technology of using tree rings to determine the age of trees. But here we have, in the 1890s, Percival Lowell looking through his telescope and seeing canals on Mars, just like Schiaparelli had done. What Schiaparelli had originally termed canali, meaning simply channels, which might well be natural formations on the surface of the planet, now became Lowell's canals, implying deliberate construction by intelligent beings. Lowell also thought he saw areas of green at the intersection of the canals, suggesting that they might be farm fields. From this, it was just a small step to the idea that the canals were dug in desperation by water-starved beings to transport water from the Martian poles to agricultural areas near the equator, which was, in fact, the theme of Lowell's best-selling book, Mars. Unfortunately, Mars doesn't look anything like this. If anybody had any doubt, it was convincingly demonstrated by images derived from photographs taken by the Mariner spacecraft. There's just nothing on the surface of Mars that even remotely resembles canals, or for that matter, channels. So what happened? Well, even in the 19th century, telescopes were not very good. They had low magnification. They produced relatively poor images. The largest surface features on Mars were at just about the limit of the resolving power of the aided human eye, so that the stimulus information available to the perceiver was very vague and fragmentary. Under these circumstances, expectation and imagination could give free play. Just to make the point clearer, consider that the Panama Canal is about 40 miles long and its channels are about 1,000 feet wide. The Suez Canal is 101 miles long and at least 179 feet wide. The Erie Canal is about 363 miles long and about 70 feet wide. The California Aqueduct System, which runs from the Sacramento River Delta to Southern California, is about 273 miles long and the whole complex is about 40 miles wide. None of these structures on Earth would be visible from Mars using the equipment that Lowell and Schiaparelli had at their disposal. Still, Lowell thought he was seeing structures of this magnitude. At the same time, he missed completely the biggest features on the Martian surface, a volcanic cone which is 370 miles wide and 14 miles high, and the Grand Canyon of Mars which is 2,000 miles long, 120 miles wide, and as much as 6 miles deep. If Lowell couldn't see these features through his telescope, he couldn't possibly have seen canals. So even under the best of circumstances, 
19th century astronomers really only got very brief glimpses of the surface, glimpses that left much to the imagination. The observer's percepts were certainly biased by gestalt principles, such as good form, which smoothed out irregularities and connected gaps. But even so, these vague stimuli left much to the imagination, so that even careful, scientifically trained observers saw what they wanted or expected to see. Schiaparelli and Lowell, especially Lowell, connecting the dots, created continuous lines from discontinuous surface feature markings in much the same way that ancient sky watchers saw patterns of stars making up the constellations. Lowell's green farm fields are also an illusion, but of a different sort. Remember that we call Mars the red planet because its surface is an orange-red in color due to a large amount of iron oxide in the soil. And if you look at Mars through a telescope, it looks very orange-red indeed, with spots of gray-brown reflecting the presence of other minerals on the surface. And that's where the green fields come from. Remember negative afterimages and the opponent process theory of color vision? When a neutral area is surrounded by a colored area, the operation of the opponent processes give the neutral area an apparent color opposite to that of the field. And the opposite of orange-red is a kind of bluish green, which is what Lowell saw as a negative afterimage, but interpreted as an agricultural area. All of these considerations, physiological like the opponent processes, and psychological like expectations and beliefs, played into the perceptual process and caused people to see things that weren't really there. What happened to Schiaparelli and Lowell underscores the point that in perception the stimulus isn't always clear. It's often vague and fragmentary and ambiguous. The information provided by the stimulus is vague and contradictory, and under these circumstances, which are the circumstances in which a lot of perception takes place, the perceiver has to take what he or she knows, believes, and expects, and combine that with whatever information is available in the light to construct a mental representation of the external world. That's what the constructivist view of perception is all about. So there you have it, two contrasting views of perception. The ecological view of associated with James J. Gibson, which argues that all the information needed for perception is provided by the stimulus. All the perceiver has to do is extract that information, and that information is sufficient to allow the perceiver to perceive the world directly, immediately, as it really is. And in contrast, the constructivist view, which dates back to the 19th century and the work of Helmholtz, and represented best in the 20th century by the work of Jerome Bruner, who argued that perception requires the perceiver to go beyond the information given. The information given by the stimulus may be vague, contradictory, ambiguous, fragmentary, and one way or another insufficient for perception, and that what the perceiver has to do is to draw on his or her knowledge of the world, make inferences, actively construct the perception, actively construct the mental representation of the world to solve the problem of what's out there, where is it, and what's it doing. So who's right? Well, obviously, I think that the constructivist view has more going for it because it accounts for the very many instances in which stimulation is just inadequate for perception. But in the final analysis, it's very clear that perception is not just a product of information provided by the stimulus. Nor, for that matter, is perception just a process of the perceiver imposing his or her expectations, beliefs, and knowledge on the external world. Rather, perception is problem-solving activity, in which the perceiver has to make sense of information available from diverse sources. First, information from the proximal stimulus, including the entire sensory field, extraoception as well as proprioception, 
and analyzed by bottom-up processes. And second, information derived from memory, including expectations, beliefs, and world knowledge of the sort contributed by top-down processing. The perceiver does extract information from the stimulus input, just like Gibson said, but the perceiver also employs inferential rules to make a judgment about the object, a kind of best guess of what the object is, where it is, and what it's doing. These guesses are usually very accurate. After all, we usually see the world pretty much as it really is, but it's not necessarily so. Conflicting information, incorrect assumptions, and using the wrong rules may lead the perceiver to make the wrong inferences about what is going on in the world. This problem-solving, constructive approach to perception is sometimes known as the perceptual cycle, a term introduced by an American cognitive psychologist, Ulrich Neisser, in 1976. The observer's task is to perceive the stimulus in the environment. But the observer never enters into any perceptual encounter cold. Instead, he or she carries into the situation a pre-existing mental representation of the world, a set of knowledge and beliefs, expectations, that Nicer calls a schema. This schema includes generalized knowledge about objects, events, and the relations between them, as well as specific expectations about what he or she is going to encounter in the environment. The distal stimulus then provides information, which is picked up by the sensory systems when the proximal stimulus is transduced by the sensory receptors into neural impulses transmitted through the nervous system to the brain. This pattern of proximal stimulation is decoded by perceptual processes such as feature detection and pattern recognition. If the stimulus information fits readily into whatever schema happens to be active, the object is immediately categorized and is not processed further in the absence of active attention. But if there's a mismatch between the stimulus and the schema, recognition of that discrepancy initiates further cognitive activity. The perceiver may, may pay fuller attention to the object, providing a closer examination of available features or the perceiver may physically manipulate the object to reveal new features. Or the perceiver may engage in perceptual inferences, making judgments based on what is already known from information provided by the stimulus and knowledge retrieved from memory. In this way, as Nicer puts it, perception is where cognition and reality meet. So the perceptual cycle begins when there's kind of a mismatch between the information extracted from the object and the information that the perceiver expects on the basis of some schema. And that cycle continues in a process of assimilation and accommodation. By assimilation, the perceiver transforms the percept until it fits the schema. In accommodation, the perceiver transforms the schema until it can incorporate the percept. The final percept leads to a kind of compromise. At that point, the perceptual cycle has been completed, the object has been identified, and it's categorized. But it begins all over again as soon as the perceiver encounters some new, surprising object or event in the environment, an object or event that does not fit the prevailing schema. So when the stimulus is rich in information and well-structured, Perception proceeds pretty much the way Gibson describes it. It doesn't require much thought, and it runs off in a relatively automatic fashion. But if this stimulus information is vague, fragmentary, ambiguous, and contradictory, as it so often is, perception requires active problem-solving on the part of the perceiver. In this case, the final percept is going to be a kind of compromise between expectations and reality. And what that also means is that different perceivers, with different beliefs, different knowledge about the world, different expectations, different personalities, with different cultural backgrounds, 
may very well perceive the same object or event quite differently, a situation known as constructive alternativism. Sometimes the information available in the stimulus is all we need to perceive the world accurately. However, the stimulus is often insufficient or ambiguous, so that the perceiver must engage in what the British psychologist Frederick C. Bartlett called effort after meaning. In Bruner's phrase, going beyond the information given by the stimulus. Perception draws on the perceiver's knowledge, expectations, and beliefs. It requires the perceiver to make inferences, whether conscious or unconscious, and it entails problem solving and hypothesis testing as the perceiver tries to figure out what the object is, where it is, what it's doing, what could possibly be giving rise to the available pattern of proximal stimulation. Perception is not like looking at a picture. It's like painting a picture anew each time based on fragmentary materials and the perceiver's imagination.